So our next speaker is Clayton Bennett. He's with um, the Georgia Department of Transportation and he's the state bridge inspection engineer. He's been with the Georgia DOT since 2002, which that would make 15 years? Yeah, 15 years. I can still do math. Um, seven years as the bridge inspection engineer and um, he received his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Georgia Tech, you and Andy. Uh, prior to joining the Department of Transportation, Clayton was involved in hazardous work. So, after listening to our counterparts in Texas and Louisiana, the problem I had about a week and a half ago doesn't seem to be so great right now. So, um, I was asked to uh, put a presentation together by Andy Doyle, who has left bridge maintenance now and has gone over to the dark side of maintenance. And I uh, wanted me to put a presentation together regarding the emergency responses that Georgia uses. So when I first came on with the department um, into bridge maintenance, um, I came out of bridge design. And in the top left corner was a, a bridge that I went out to, was sent out to to look at it. And I was a bridge designer. And I saw that, and I freaked out. Those don't bother me so much now. Well, that was that one. And then about two years after that, in the top right corner, we had uh, a bridge that got hit by a uh, track hoe. Those are 74 inch bulb tees and that bridge actually has 17 feet, two inches of clearance on it. Cut four of them right in half. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then I thought many things would never get worse than that. And then here at the bottom shows a span on Interstate I-85 that's on the ground, which happened about a week and a half ago that everybody knows about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I just wanted to give you a rough idea of what we see. Everybody, all my fellow partners out there, you guys all see the same thing. This is a railroad bridge that probably gets hit, what would you say, Andy, every two months? We have it signed that it only has about 11 foot, 5 inches of clearance, and 18 wheelers still think they can get underneath it. And they peel half their tops off, and we call the railroad, and the railroad comes out and fixes it and keep going on. This is a, a drive-through truss that we have. Our maintenance guys found this one. This bridge had clearance of around 14.5. And the member you see there is actually a tension member that when the portal got hit, pushed it forward longitudinally seven inches and drew it into the bridge five inches. We immediately um, brought that bridge down to a, a five-ton posting and when I was out there with our consultant looking at this, we had tractor trailers going over, fully loaded. We had three, and this is the one that really amazed me, we had three concrete trucks right behind each other going over top of this bridge. So even though we don't think our bridges can take a lot when they get damaged, I watched it all day long out there. Our law enforcement was having a good time writing tickets all day long out there too. So it isn't just steel that we have problems with. This is actually a bridge on I-285 that one of our consultant inspectors found. And this is just one photograph. There were four beams in this area that were, had the problems. These are T-beams. The back of the T-beam had been spalled off about four inches approximately. And then we lost the front part of the cap. So I had about two and a half inches of beam that was sitting on something solid up there. And we obviously went into an emergency situation for that because four beams all side by side were like this, and this is where the tractor and trailers were running on it. So when you're standing on the bridge, the bridge was just bouncing up and down. So the procedure that Georgia uses in determining um, if we're going to deem something an emergency contract or not is as follows. Um, myself, Bob Daniels, who's my counterpart on inspections, or Andy, We'll be on site when we get the call for it. We'll make a determination whether or not the bridge is safe for the traveling public or not. If we warrant that it is not, then we'll contact Andy if he's not on site, make the deter uh, tell him what our findings are, and then he'll make the phone call to um, our upper management, with, which would be the state bridge engineer, the director of engineering, and then the chief engineer. So, um, so to go back, um, Andy would contact um, bridge Bridge, uh, Bill Duvall, who's our state bridge engineer, the chief engineer, and the director of engineering. Tell them what the problem is. Get verification from them that they're okay with us deeming this an emergency situation. And then the director of finance is, is contacted. The director of finance will issue us an emergency number. 
that we can use into a contract that we're putting together. While items two and three are actually going on, item four is actually being developed at the same time. So we have an emergency contract that's just a boilerplate, and I have a series of slides that I'll show you guys, and I've highlighted in yellow the only items that we need to change in this, in this boilerplate plate contract. It's approximately 11 pages long, and then we have some attachments on the back of it for plans or, or other information for the contractors. We will, um, once the emergency contract's put together, we'll send it out to a minimum of three contractors that do work for us in the state. We'll allow the contractors four to seven days to bid on it, and then we will award the contract the same day the bids come in. We'll usually ask for the bids to come in at noon, and usually by one o'clock we'll award the contract and get a contractor out there. Normally we restrict our contractor, once we award it to them, they've got 30 to 45 days to complete the work. It doesn't matter what it is. That includes if shop drawings have to be done for jacking plans or whatever, we, we really crunch the hammer on them and tell them to get it done. So this is just the cover page of the contract. In yellow where it says project number and county, those would be two items that would be changed. On the second one, agreement of services. Um, the only thing in there, I know you guys can't read this very well, the only thing in, that we say in there is how long the contract's going to be. This one was for 40 days. This was a, a, a bridge that was up in Jackson County, steel beams that got hit by a track hoe. Um, it moved the first beam that it hit, I think, seven inches out of plumb and tore the bottom flange. And then it hit the number three beam and moved that about four inches out of plumb. When Andy was up in the basket truck, a tractor trailer went over it and he actually felt the bridge come down and go back up. We actually closed the road at that point and then um, gave the contractor 40 days to get this done. Um, the next one is just a, a signature sheet, table of contents. This is the um, invitation to bid and realistically all that's gonna change in this is just gonna be who the contact people are, what the project numbers are, what the bridge structure ID numbers are, and that's it. This one here is our special conditions and plan sheets. Other miscellaneous things. Um, I, didn't, I didn't highlight this area right in here. This area should have been highlighted also, I missed it. Um, that's any special provisions that we might have to attach to the plan sheet we list in there. Certifications, conduct of interest, safety, drug-free, workplace, utility conflicts. I can't read the bottom one. And then that's the final page for this for general release of all claims. That's a boilerplate contract that we use on all of our emergency contracts right now. Um, we've been using this, I've been doing this now for seven, eight, nine years, been using the same contract. Our lawyers have looked at it, they're still good with it. If anybody wants a copy of this, I can, I can email a copy if you guys want to use it. You guys may have your own in place. So, I want to talk about this bridge. Um, this was uh, a bridge that goes over I-16 coming from Savannah to Macon, Georgia. It's about the middle part of the state. Um, this bridge was brand new. We hadn't even accepted it yet. They were doing a punch list on it. One exit up the road, <clears throat> the, the city of Dublin was holding a, a wastewater rodeo. And people had brought in equipment to show off their equipment like that. And they loaded up a, a track hoe, and they were going one exit south of this bridge. And uh, he came down the ramp. He had about a mile and a half to get going up to speed and hit this bridge. He cut four 74-inch bulb tees in half. and. It's an amazing sight when you're, you, you haven't been out of the bridge office that long. You've designed these things and you walk out and everything's hanging down. It looks like steel spaghetti hanging in the road. We had two maintenance workers that were in the Gore area before the ramp for this bridge that actually ran out into the middle of the road and stopped traffic on I-16. Nobody got injured at all on this. No, no damage to cars or anything on it. The next photograph shows how much the bridge actually dropped. We pulled a string line across that, and the bridge in that section had dropped four inches from that hit, but had not come down. Um, our bridges are pretty resilient, just like everybody else's out there. We, everything works very well in them. Um, I was out on this bridge for six days. 
we ended up having to, um, and we learned lessons from this one, we had to saw cut the beams and the, each of the bays. And we had a crane trying to hold this up. Now, most of you guys have worked with riggers before in the past. They're a unique lot to work with. So we told them they had to pick up the beam a little bit so the saws could work. And they'd pick it up too much and then the saw would bind up. And then we'd be stuck for five or six hours trying to get the saw jammed and, and like that. We've worked up, or I worked up another procedure to do this in the future, which will involve the hydroblaster to go in there and, and blast the concrete out so we can cut the rebar instead of getting involved in the in cutting of the, of the deck itself and binding up the saws when we're trying to take the beams out. The culprit didn't get away in this case, so we knew who, who did it. We, um, we got some money back from him, but he didn't have enough money to actually cover everything on this. One of the photographs I'm not showing in this is that he cut four of the beams in half, went underneath the bridge, and just before he got out from underneath it, he, um, he hit two other beams and damaged those, and we actually had those beams replaced too because it was a brand new bridge. We were fortunate that the contractor that built the bridge was only working a half a mile down the road and could mobilize on site and start taking this apart immediately as we were getting plans. We were actually taking it apart as we were getting plans put together for it. All right. The next photograph is, um, is a little fun that we had up in Atlanta about a week and a half ago. So at around 6.15 um, on a Thursday night, I got a phone call from our traffic management center saying there was a car on fire underneath the bridge on A85. And I said, okay, we have those periodically. I said, I'll get an inspector out there to it, but we really can't look at anything until, um, until the fire is put out. The guy said, I don't think you understand. We got 10 to 15 foot flames coming up the side of the bridge right now. And I hadn't, I hadn't turned on the television, so I didn't know exactly everything that was going on. But when he told me that, I said, okay, I'm getting in the car and I'll come to you. In the same, just as soon as I got off the phone with him, I called Bob O'Daniels, who's my counterpart in inspections, told him we were going to meet up. Shortly before I finished that call, I think Andy called me and told me, he asked me if I knew what was going on. I said, yeah, we're trying to mobilize them. Bill Duvall, the chief. Uh, the state bridge engineer, he called me about it. And then the fourth call I got as I was going down the interstate about 85 miles an hour was for the commissioner, asking me if I knew what was going on, if I was on my way to site. So I traveled about 20 minutes down, down the interstate, and then I think Andy called me back and told me we had a span down. And this is the span you see here. This is, I, this is looking north on I-85 North. Um, it's a unique situation when you roll up on the bridge and see one of your spans sitting there on the ground. This is just a, another shot looking just to the right of it at the adjacent, the, that's the southbound bridge that you're looking at right there. <clears throat> all, of us, uh, all of us owners in the state or in the, in the country right now are trying to figure out what to do with EV2s and 3s. We didn't think we had any EV2s or 3s in the state. Two of them showed up. They came from the airport. They showed up with 5,000 gallons of water in them and 2,000 gallons of foam. And actually, the fire chiefs told me that if they could have gotten through traffic and got them up there quicker, they could have put the fire out and we would not have lost the spans. I took this at night. Um, this photo, what I was trying to show here, is the southbound span that's immediately adjacent to the span that went down. All the beams in here had delaminated and had strands exposed and throughout the course of the night as they were cooling, you could hear popping and then you'd hear debris falling off the, bridge, off, the, off the beams. So part of my responsibility when I was out there is to make a determination of what was salvageable. At the time, we were still wondering if we were going to be able to use I-80, or I-85 southbound or not. Um, it, was, it was pretty easy to make the determination that I-85 southbound, this particular span was shot also. So that was the span immediately adjacent to it. When we, um, when we walked it back in there farther, the next span north on I-85 southbound, about a third of those beams had suffered the same damage. Um, that they had delaminated at the ends, and we had strands exposed. The decision was made at that time we were going to take that span down also. So right there I have, I have three spans that are going to be removed and replaced. On the I-85 northbound side, when we were able to finally get over to that and look at that, we had lost about half of those beams to heat also. 
So there was number, span number four that went down. When the commissioner showed up at around 1.32 o'clock that morning, he asked me what the condition was, where we stood with different things, and I told him the span that he and I were standing underneath, which is uh, the next span southbound on I-85. I think we can salvage this one, and I think I can salvage the trapezoidal span that's um, immediately south of uh, uh, the span that went down. That was where I was standing when I took the first photograph. Unfortunately, through the course of the evening, everything was jet black from the smoke. Unfortunately, through the course of the evening, as we had a couple of small rain events come through and the temperature would drop about 10 degrees, you could actually see cracks showing up and delamination starting to happen on it. Um, I went up in one of the basket trucks just as soon as we got enough light around 5 o'clock in the morning and started hammering on one of the beams. And I hit one of the beams with a three pound hammer and watched the crack just chase halfway down the beam. I started hitting that a little bit and that whole thing was delaminated. So at that point I'd known, I knew I lost my fifth span at that point. So I've lost, at that point I lost three spans in the southbound direction. And when I went over and looked at the trapezoidal span, I had the same condition going on there. Um, the heat just had to be extremely intense of what was going on there to do this much damage. This photograph is of, um, this is the span, this is the span on the ground here. This is the northern uh, bent for it. And you can see the delamination here. Rebar is already exposed. You can see it coming off here, here. This one here, um, you could actually see where some of the, the steel had started to buckle. So another photograph, this is the, the one where we, I was just saying the span, it's, or the, the steel had started to buckle. This is the, the adjacent pier, the fire was in here. This was all delaminated. These caps are inverted T's, and the bottom of those were all delaminated, and fully, uh, all the steel was fully exposed there. I just, I like this bent. This is the one bent that bothered me the most out of anything that we had up there. The amount of heat that this took, you can see the, the amount of damage that it, that it took. So the demolition right now is concluded. And what they've done is they came down eight feet, 10 inches, cut the, cap, or cut the columns off, <clears throat> and then have um, taken all the delaminated concrete off. And what we're finding is once we get that delaminated concrete out of there, um, we have good sound concrete which really surprised me, especially on this, this bent location. This is just a view of the, of the bottom of the cap. Um, you see all the stirrups are exposed. There's a, a little bit of moment steel that's exposed here. Um, in a number of locations, obviously we're taking all those down. This is that one, I for some reason just fell in love with this one column out here. You can see all the delamination all the way around it. Um, we had the fire kept flaring up throughout the course of the evening. Um, the fire department stayed on site with us, trying to help us as much as they could. And this was approximately 6 o'clock in the morning um, is when we started demolition. So we brought the track hoe in. The fire department could not put out the fire when the span dropped. It basically smothered it. Um, but it was, still, it was still going there, just depending on which way the wind was shifting. So we brought the track hoe in and he started chipping this out so the fire department could get in there and be able to put that out. And they had flare ups around the, uh, around the hoe on a, a number of different occasions but the fire department was able to work on that and we could keep working on it. Where we stand at this bridge right now, all the demolition's done. From what I got told today, I think they've poured back all the columns and they're starting to tie up the steel, put the steel in place for the caps. The department right now is uh, estimating that we'll have this bridge open, both bridges will open back up by June 15th. We'll probably make a little bit better time than that, but that's where we officially stand with it right at the moment. For, for emergencies? Emergency um, response. Yeah, we go ahead and we, we, get all that, we, we get all that taken care of uh, up front as, as we're putting the emergency contract together. We're talking with our environmental group and they get that cleared for us. Um, they talk to the FHWA partners and anybody else that might be involved in that. Um, for the, the last bridge I was talking about, we had um, EPA was out on site a few times. And uh, one time, me and them had a slight disagreement because 
they wanted to know where all the water and foam was running off on site and wanted to go back <laughs> through the area. It was not a stable area at that time. We still had concrete falling off. And I said, you can't go back in there. He said, I'm EPA. I said, I don't care. <laughs> Get out of here. So they, they, they were more worried about where water was running off to versus what, what was going on with the structure and what the safety was out there. For some of us uh, that don't understand, Forget the fire because obviously you can get blood out of a turnip. But when one of these tractor trailers or a piece of equipment hits the structure, is that something because it's it's posted the height limit that you can go back and get you know, the company to pay for or contribute yeah. to the repair? You can. Okay. okay. I wasn't sure. You know the the one the the emergency contract I I put up on the board that was up in Jackson County. We knew who hit it. Um, I got the police report. And I've already turned that over to our lawyers, and they've already opened the case for it, and they're already talking to the insurance company. And, um, and basically, we're going to send them the bill that we got for doing the work. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.